Hello friends and welcome to a new episode of the Just Another Mindset podcast. The show that inspires you to change and live a more exciting life. My name is Ismail and each week I bring to you a relevant conversation, message or topic that will not only entertain you but help you to change towards a more meaningful and satisfying life individually and collectively. Let us get inspired and embrace collective changes for the better. In today's episode, I have the great pleasure to talk to Mark Harper, who is a consultant anesthetist at Brighton and Sussex University Hospitals, who accidentally and via quite unrelated routes has developed an interest in the negative effects of getting cold during surgical operations and the positive effects of cold water swimming. His professional life and his PhD are based around keeping patients warm. However, his research increasingly involves immersing people and himself in cold water in collaboration with the Extreme Environments Laboratory at Portsmouth University. In this episode, you will learn about the cold water swim cure and the amazing benefits of swimming in cold water. We talk about how Mark, himself a doctor by profession, found out about the benefits of cold water 20 years ago and what he has learned ever since. We talk about hyperthermia, stress, depression, anxiety and what all of these have to do with cold water. Or rather, what cold water can do in order to prevent and also to cure. We talk about physiological and mental benefits of cold water swims and we discuss selected success stories that will blow your mind. You will also learn how to prepare yourself for cold water swims and why you don't have to be extreme in order to reap the benefits discussed. And with that, Mark, a warm welcome to the Just Another Mindset podcast. And my first question for you today is, how do you feel and what is on your mind? Well, right now I feel quite warm. I've I had my swim in the sea, but I'm in a, in a warm flat with the sun coming in. And uh, that's, how I, that's how I feel. Warm and, uh, yeah, and looking forward to, uh, to having a conversation. Wonderful. And you already hinted a little bit at the topic, what we're going to talk about. You talked about a cold water swim and actually this is what we want to talk about about cold exposure and cold water and swimming in cold water and maybe mark you could give our audience a little bit of context about yourself and when did you start swimming in water or swimming in cold water well the those two Two things are very different when I started swimming, when I started swimming in cold water. But basically, my background is uh, I'm a doctor. I'm a specifically uh, specialized as an anesthetist. My research used to be, uh, still is to an extent, about stopping patients getting cold during surgery. You get cold during surgery, that's bad for you. You have more complications after surgery. But as a part of that, I started reading about cold adaptation and how that affected, affected the body. Well, we can go into that later. But around the same time, uh, there's also, so I've, uh, uh, when it comes to swimming, I've always swum, but I've always swum in the pool. And one summer, I just moved, I grew up in Brighton. I live there now, but just after I'd moved back, after doing most of my medical education in London, I uh, com- was complaining to a friend because the pool was shut for a couple of weeks in the summer. I was complaining to an old friend of mine about this. And he said, oh, you go and swim in the sea. I said, I didn't even realise the club we were part of had a sea swimming section. And, and I was as shocked as anyone else when I discovered that they had, you know, they swam all year round. But anyway, I went along just for a, just for a couple of weeks in the summer and still remember that first time walking back up the beach thinking, God, this feels, this feels so good. 
just wasn't expecting it. Yeah, I always feel good from a swim, whether it's in the pool or the sea, but there was something extra about it. And those two weeks have turned into nearly 20 years. Of swimming in the cold. And you remember walking back up on the beach and remembering that it felt so great. Do you also remember how it felt when you first went into the water? Sure, I think they, I haven't changed very much yet. That experience of getting into the cold water, maybe it's changed a little bit, but essentially, I don't think I'm any tougher than I used to be. It's still hard getting into the water. I still go there and I, I you know, unless I have to avoid a wave, you know, I'll, I'll take a while to actually get into the water. So I absolutely remember that. It's the same experience I have now, really. And you said that you were going for your cold water swim this morning in Brighton. And another question I had is, what is the current water temperature in Brighton? And what do you consider cold water to be? Where does it start? Well, the, the water temperature at the moment is 14, 15 degrees centigrade. And that's a nice temperature. I like that. It's, you get a real buzz out of it, but it's not too cold. It's not actually difficult getting in. You know, I make a bit of a meal of it, but you know, it's, uh, it's not difficult getting in at that temperature. So what I consider cold water is anything less than 20 degrees. And that's actually the maximum temperature of pretty much all outdoor water in the UK in the summer. It, it might vary a little, but that's you know, a good ballpark figure. The reason for that is one of the most uh, immediate effects of getting into cold water is all the blood vessels supplying your skin suddenly close up, vasoconstriction. They, they, they shut off to keep, to stop that cold from the outside penetrating the inside. It's all there to protect your, your brain, your kidneys, your heart, whatever. And that vasoconstriction is maximal at 20 degrees centigrade. So by 20, below 20, you're having a really strong physiological effect. It does, there, there are greater effects the cooler you get, although probably not much more, uh, there's not much greater increase below 10 degrees centigrade uh, in terms of the way your body reacts. You know, it's at maximum reaction at that stage. And between 10 and 15 is probably where you get the maximum adaptation. But the, yeah, that, that figure of 20 is where you're really beginning to, I think, feel the benefits. Mm, that's super interesting because what I hear is that you get most of the benefits, which I'm sure we're going to spend quite some time on discussing today, in this range between 20 and 10 degrees Celsius. So there is no need to go much lower than 10 degrees because then it actually gets super refreshing. Let's just call <laughs> yeah. it. What is a water temperature that you say you have to be really cautious with going inside the water? I mean, probably already 10 degrees, you may or may not choose to go with somebody else. Usually it's more fun anyways. But do you have any thoughts on temperatures that, yeah, one should also be cautious about? I, I think 10 degrees is probably how where you should put the cut off. And I don't think it's particularly scientific. I mean, you could make scientific arguments, but at that point, it starts becoming painful, you know, not particularly on the body, but I sort of find my hands and my feet below below nine, really. But, you know, they, that's when they begin to get uncomfortable and you know, the colder it gets, it actually becomes painful. And it becomes painful afterwards as well. So at those temperatures, I, I wear gloves and shoes. It's not... Yeah, the, the, the point is, this is it's about being fun. You know, my, my mantra is minimize discomfort, maximize fun. And as long as your body is exposed to the water, and, and we'll go into this later, you know, the, getting your face in as well. Once you've done that, that's fine. Hands, feet, doesn't matter. Length of time you do it, you know, largely doesn't matter. Yeah, it's, it's just getting in and feeling, you know, feeling that cold. But below 10, it's, yeah, below 10, it's where you should start uh, thinking, you know, it, yeah, I find that really cold, put it that way. <laughs> no, absolutely. I do agree. And actually, I want to quote or paraphrase a friend of mine who also goes into the cold water quite a bit. And he said, it's not so much about lasting in the very cold water, but it's more about getting warm afterwards. Again, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. So it's not so difficult to go into water of eight degrees. 
but it's super difficult to get warm afterwards if the hot shower is not just 20 meters away. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Or yes, uh, well, yes, uh, it, it can be difficult to get warm afterwards. It depends how long you spend in there. If you're just in there for five minutes, three minutes even when it's super cold, you're still getting a good effect and it's not so difficult to get warm afterwards. The thing about getting warm, yeah, it can take a really long time. Essentially, your body's kind of a storage heater, or, or rather your skin and your fat, you know, those outer layers are, are this storage heater. And if that, if, one thing to improve things is to go in warm. So, you know, you've just got heat. You know, your body is you know, absolutely maxed out with heat. The storage heater is full. And you can do that from, say, going into a sauna. And that will help. You know, but you've got to be warm all the way through. And that will help when you come out because whatever length of time you've been in, you will get less cold, essentially. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so getting warm afterwards, you know, your, your, your insides are very insulated from the outside, so it's difficult to pick it up. Your blood, the blood isn't circulating round. So, you know, whatever warm water or warm you apply to the skin isn't going to be as effective as quickly so it is difficult and the other thing is you continue cooling afterwards so one of these things about warming up afterwards you actually cool down before you can warm up because that that cold in your uh, you know your layer of insulation that conducts into the core gradually and so it's both a matter of being difficult to warm up and a matter of you continuing to cool down. Cool down. Mm, no, that makes perfect thanks. Uh, perfect sense. Thank you very much for that, Mark. And maybe before we go into the physiological benefits of cold water, a little bit more context. And how often do you go into the cold water? Is that a daily activity for you, in fact? Or yeah, how often do you go there? Uh, it varies a bit. I suppose it's at least once or twice a week. Sometimes it's five or six times a week. Essentially, I, I try and get in. I, I, I do fitness swimming in the pool, so a couple of days a week I might do that. So I'll always go in the pretty much every day before work. I'll go go in the water, whether it's inside or outside. But for going outside, yeah, two, three, four times a week generally. Okay. Depends on how much time you can make. Wonderful. Yeah, exactly. Um... And sometimes, you know, here in Brighton, the issue is that uh, the waves can be too big. You know, it'd just be too dangerous to get in. Well, in fact, as, a, as you know, one of my rules is, you know, as with everything in life, it's, or nearly everything in life, it's almost anything is easier to get into than out of. So you will always be able to get into the sea, really. But it's whether you can get out of it in one piece. That's the that's the issue. No, absolutely, absolutely. And how much time do you try to spend in the water then, if you happen to go to the cold water in Brighton Sea? I, I don't actually try and spend any specific time in the water. You know, it's I. Uh, it's a matter of what I feel like doing that day. The thing is you don't have to spend very long in. By the time you, you go in, you go into the water, you get that initial shock and you, get, you, know, you take that big intake of breath and you think, oh, yeah, this is really cold. And then you, well, the, the word I like to use is recombobulate. You know, you're just all, all over the place and suddenly it comes back, your breathing comes back and you if, feel if not comfortable, you know, you, you know you, everything calms down. And as long as you've been in that long, really, you've done... 80% of the good already. Uh, you need to put your face in the water as well, but that's a, that's a slightly different matter. But it's just, it really doesn't matter. And so a lot of people, I mean, the term used is dipping. And dipping really is just as effective as swimming. And swimming is great, you know, it's exercise. We know exercise is good for you, but if you want to just target the benefits of the cold, just getting in for a few minutes, feeling the cold, getting over the cold, that's enough. So yeah, it's just, today I feel like a short swim, today I feel like a long swim, today I'm just gonna mess around for a few minutes in the waves, you know, 
Okay, it really depends. And yeah, I mean, maybe we're going to talk about what actually happens to the body if it gets immersed to cold water. But I can really confirm that I am a big fan of cold water myself. And I would say it's even like 15, maybe 30 seconds. I don't track it. But once you go in, you will always feel that cold I don't know if it's a shock, but this cold wave coming in, this cold water. And after not that long of time, one actually does feel much better. And one actually, for myself, personally speaking, I feel that it's not so cold anymore. And it sounds like we can reap a lot of benefits within the first, I don't know, two, three, five. Again, I don't count the time being in the water but that's uh, very interesting that you don't need to spend at least half an hour or whatever minutes in there yeah I, and that's absolutely right you've got it spot on that's uh, exactly how i i find it and how i think physiologically it makes sense and you know and the, the, the thing is you know one of the really important things so as i said to you earlier when i'm doing my research into patients getting cold during surgery uh, you know, becoming hypothermic, you know, clinically hypothermic is always bad for you. It's bad for you if you go into the water uh, just for fun, like we do, or it's bad for you if you have an operation. If you have an operation, you get cold, you have more complications. So, yeah, and it's like going to the gym. You, know, you go into the gym, you expose yourself, you know, you push yourself, you, you know, use those muscles and you feel a bit sore afterwards. In the sea, it's more a bit cold afterwards. But if you become hypothermic, actually you're doing more harm than good because at that point you've strained the muscle, you've overworked your muscle, you've injured yourself. So it's really important not to not to push it too much because you're not going to get any more benefit and actually you're likely to do yourself a bit more harm than good. No, it sounds like. What is, Mark, for those who do not know, but what is hypothermia and why is it so important to know about it? Well, hypothermia just basically means that the body gets too cold. You know, it gets below its optimal functioning level. And the body is incredibly sensitive. It's so good at regulating temperature. You go between about 36.5, 37.5 body temperature, maybe a little in the low 36s, uh, particularly in the morning. It's got this circadian rhythm. So in the morning, you tend to be colder than you are in the evening. And... It's so, it works so hard to maintain your core at that temperature because all our systems, our enzyme systems, our organs, everything works best at those temperatures. The only exception to this is our immune system, which, which works better at a slightly higher temperature, which is why you get fever because at a slightly higher temperature, then you can kill off the invading bugs. But really, most of the time, you know, it, it keeps us there. And anything below that, the body just, slows down you know it just doesn't work as well so that's what we're trying to avoid and it can also damage the body because kind of the internal repair systems sort of stop working mm. and how does going or exposing yourself into cold water can help with hypothermia or becoming hypothermic it only helps to an extent, I think, going to cold water with the hypothermia itself. Because you, with that, you, know, you, you just become a little bit more resilient. But you know, essentially, the, you know, your body reacts a little bit quicker as you get used to it. But on the whole, there isn't that much benefit actually specifically against hypothermia that you get. You shiver, you actually have a lower... You, know, you shiver at a lower temperature, so which might actually be a bad thing because you're not generating that extra heat. That's what shivering does; it generates heat. So, yeah, I don't think and there's a massive benefit against hypothermia. It's the benefit against all the other things, which is where I think it has its has its uh, role. Mm. Okay, so it's not that if you expose yourself to cold water, let's say three, four, five times per week, that you will not get hypothermia anymore. But it's rather like you maybe build a little bit of a tolerance, a little bit more resilience, but it's not drastic or a massive increase, decrease in temperature. But what are the great benefits then of going to cold water that you experienced yourself and that you also experience with patients? 
friends, clients, I don't know what exactly you call them. Uh, yeah, so sort of take it back a bit. So what is important, if you expose yourself to any stress, you grow stronger. You, know, you expose yourself to the stress of a gym, you expose yourself to the stress of running, you expose yourself to the stress of cold water. That helps you grow stronger. And the good thing about things like this, particularly about cold water, it's such an all-encompassing reaction. It's your whole body is involved in that. And the, I think that if you look at the basic way in which it improves things, it's about our stress response and specifically about our inflammatory response. Now, both of these things are vital to our existence. They're evolutionary things and we need them. And stress, you know, uh, you can talk about stress, stress, and you stress. You stress is good. That helps focus and things like this. However, if you're running at a high level of stress all the time, you can go into the bad zone. You've got the good physiological zone. That's the you stress. And you've got the bad pathological zone. And if you're running at a high level all the time and you, your body reacts very violently or whatever, you know, exaggeratedly to that, you spend a lot of time in the bad zone. So what you get from cold water swimming is you adapt to cold water. And adapting, as yeah, we've already discussed the temperature, anything below 20 degrees, and it happens over about six times. So you can do it in about six swims. And I would say, yeah, talk about my tolerance to hypothermia. I think after those first six swims, 20 years later, I'm still no more tolerant of cold than I was, was then. Uh, but yeah, so you adapt to cold water. And that what that does is it brings your baseline down, because it brings your baseline of stress down and your reaction to the stress of the cold and the other stresses is reduced. So that peak, those peaks are less and the baseline is less. So you end up spending less time in the bad zone and more time in the good zone. And that is not only true for the stress you feel when going into the cold water, but that is true for any stress that you or I experience. We, 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 haven't, checked, we haven't checked any stress, but okay. what we can say is that we ha there have been studies done which show cross-adaptation. I mean, the, the study, they, the, the sort of most relevant study, I suppose, is they were getting people to exercise in a low oxygen environment. So doing a bike test in the low oxygen environment half of the people went through a cold adaptation program and half didn't and those who had been through the program performed better the next time they went to that uh low oxygen environment than the ones who didn't and they actually performed better overall whereas the others showed no change in their in their performance so that shows you know cold Cold water exposure improves your function in a low oxygen environment. Mm, no, it sounds like. And what I find very interesting that as little as six times or a couple of times going into the cold water actually can build that resistance or that getting used to. So it's not that you need to do it like you did it for the past 20 years, a couple of times per week, but a few times can already really reap some benefits on your stress levels that's very interesting yeah and, and this adaptation you know one other study they, they did is that they looked at how long the effects last and they just put people through again this is the classic here it's six say six times temperature about 15 degrees maybe a little lower and they found that you know as you measure it the, the, the respiratory response here you know, the your breathing response and your heart rate response and your blood pressure response they still saw 60% of that adaptation uh, over a year later when the study finished. So it's a, it's a long lasting effect. However, you can get an additional effect. So what we're talking about there is the stress reaction, the fight flight sympathetic based reaction. And so what it's doing is it's reducing that. But the other side of the autonomic nervous system, so we've got everything in the body is this beautifully, a uh, beautifully balanced uh, system. You know, you get the blood vessels closing down when you get into the cold to keep you warm. You get them opening up and sweating when it's hot to cool you down. And the other side of that, so if we want to reduce stress, we can either reduce the sympathetic response, is what adaptation does, reduce that fight-flight response, or we can strengthen the rest-digest or parasympathetic response 
because that will tend to pull it back to the low stress level. And we get that every time we go into the water, if we put our face in the water, because the face, stimulating the face directly with cold has a direct effect on the parasympathetic nervous system and reduces your heart rate, things like this. And it was quite interesting. I did a, I've, uh, my, I've done a couple of days with uh, teenagers, including uh, one with my 16-year-old son's class last year. And what one of the things we do is we get them to we measure their heart rate and we get them to put their face in ice cold water and you know continuously monitor their heart rate. And then as they take it out, they put it in for a few seconds, you know, 10, 15 seconds. Again, just, just long enough that you get past that initial shock. And they take it out again and you see the heart rate go down. It's just brilliant. It's uh, you know, and it's the same as the diving reflex in babies, and but it's much, much more pronounced in babies and uh, and you know, it gets less, but you still see it as you get older. So as you say, so as I say, then you're reducing the sympathetic, you're reducing that fight flight response, and you're also strengthening the parasympathetic response. And that's something you can get on a daily basis. Mm, so it's a two-sided positive effect. That sounds exactly wonderful indeed. Okay. And you talked about immersing your face in particular to cold water. We talked about swimming in cold water. What are your thoughts on, I believe seems to be a huge wave for the last couple of years, taking cold showers and yeah, immersing yourself with cold exposure that way? Well, it's, it's a good thing. It's just not as good a thing. And there are a few reasons for that. One is the actual the, the physiology, physiology of the temperature. So the two things that determine the response, the body's response to cold. One is the absolute temperature, and the other is the rate of cooling. Now, in a, in a shower, the chances are that's going to be room temperature-ish, so say 20 degrees centigrade. And so that's relatively warm, certainly where I live, that's warmer than the sea is most of the year. And the other is, you know, you're not getting a continuous thing of getting that water on you, whereas you immerse yourself, that is just the whole body is, is in. So it has a much more rapid effect. That's not to say it's not a good thing, particularly if you sort of put your face up and, you know, put your face under it. And there was one study which showed that office workers, a group of office workers, half of them had cold showers, half of them didn't. And the ones who had cold showers actually took less sick days. So, you know, there's a measurable effect, but it's not as much as the effect of actually going in cold water. And yeah, you could go in a bath, for example, that, that would have a more rapid cooling effect. But, you know, I think this kind of brings me on to another really important aspect to my mind about cold water swimming, which is it isn't just about the the cold it's about you know what i get out of it and what everyone gets back and what we get as that feedback from all these courses we run is that it's being outside we know that's good green therapy being near water blue therapy has an additional effect on green therapy community reduced social isolation do it with someone always do it with someone um, and then uh, exercise that's another thing. And you don't get these things in a cold shower or, or a bar. No, absolutely. So it's basically, it can be a good additional point or it can be a good start in realizing, okay, how much do you like or dislike cold water? But going into nature, I fully agree, has its benefits by itself and doing such things with a community, with a community, with friends, with a friend, certainly do help as well. Mark, I don't know what your personal experience is on that, but we just clarified or we talked a little bit about what happens to the body and why there is a lot of benefits. I have two follow up questions. The first one would be, there is a couple of things that we know are good for our bodies, getting enough sleep, resting, having a healthy diet and so forth. Would you say this cold water exposure is a nice to have or is it rather a fundamental component of having a healthy lifestyle? I don't know if you want to give any comment there. I think it can be a fundamental component 
what what I like to do is put cold water swimming in the context of what's called lifestyle medicine. And there are six basic tenets of lifestyle medicine, which are things like healthy diet and as well as you know, a community and exercise and sleeping well, you know, all these things you've mentioned. And I've always said that, in fact, so there's six components and five of them are covered by, by cold water swimming. You know, you know, even avoidance of harmful substances. You know, we know, I know of people who are addicts or have been addicts and they, use, they, find, they find cold water swimming just amazing at getting them past this. The, the sixth one, healthy diet, that isn't, yeah, might not be an issue, but I was told recently by someone that actually the cold, this kind of stimulation stimulates a butyrate or something in the gut, and actually it can have a positive effect on your gut and on your digestion and health. But, you know, it really is, you know, to me, even if you don't take that part out of it, it's just such a good component. You know, it, it, it's a whole package. That's that's what it is, you know. And you know, the body needs a package. We can just give it a bit of extra serotonin or a bit of yeah, you know, and that's SSRIs, that's antidepressants. We give it a bit of noradrenaline, and adrenaline, and things like that, and that's taking cocaine. But you know, what you need is it coming from externally, your body being in control of it, and your you know just. That is so much better than taking anything from outside. And you can do that with, within this thing of lifestyle medicine, I think. Mm, no, wonderful. Thank you very much for elaborating that. And that raises a question while you talk. Are there any side effects of cold water swims that you have encountered for yourself or with people, clients, friends that you work together? I think the most important thing is probably the cold is yeah, not getting becoming hypothermic that's kind of self-evident and it's just getting used to what your body's like you know i now know i can tell you how but i know when i'm going to need to come in you know and it might be that i go i know that after drop phenomenon yeah where you get cold 20 30 minutes afterwards you know i can avoid yeah i know when to come in to avoid after drop. So it's not I'm even at a dangerous level, but I don't particularly like that. But sometimes the waves are so much fun, I just keep going, oh, well, I'll just be a bit cold later. And so I think that's the, that's the most important thing. The other thing is kind of when you're starting, but it doesn't seem to be a problem afterwards, is that initial getting into the water. So you know, one of the first effects until you're adapted to cold water is you start hyperventilating. You cannot control your breathing to begin with when you go into cold water, you take a big gasp and you start hyperventilating. The issue is, and that's why I think it's important when you start out, it's just to put your body in the water. And this is why people die of hypo, uh, drown, or, or you know, the people unused to it end up in the cold water. It's because, it's not because their heart goes crazy or anything like that, it's because they get covered by a wave and it yeah and and they they have to take a big breath and so it's worse than not being able to breathe they have to take a big breath and that water just goes into their lungs uh so so i think that's another issue but as you get used to it again you know that short adaptation period you know you're able to breathe again uh yeah you're, you're, you're able to control your breathing so you can you know that's okay then beyond that, oh uh, and then beyond that, you know, there, you know, it's sore. Your hands and feet get cold. Uh, they're relatively minor side effects, uncomfort, uncomfortable, but relatively minor. Okay, thank you very much for sharing that, Mark. And I don't know if that is a dead end, but you talked about breathing and cold water. And I don't know if you are familiar with Wim Hof and the breathing and cold water exposure methods, I just want to call it. And if you have personally experienced such, if you do combine breathing and cold water exposure, if you think it's a good, not so good idea, any thoughts? Uh, well, I'm very familiar with Wim Hof. Um, 
I, my, my my issue with him is that it's it's too the, the, where's the fun in it it's just you know you don't see the joy in it you know it's about cold it's about how long you can last in the cold and things like this i think breathing you know breathing techniques are fantastic you know we know again that's another thing we know is really good for you what he uses is a version of tumo breathing which is what meant to warm you up as you go into the water he also does a lot of stuff where you just basically hyperventilate in fact uh, and I'm not sure, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how effective that is, whether that really makes a difference with cold water swimming or not. Yeah, I think good, well-directed breathing techniques are definitely a good thing. I think the cold water is a good thing. So as to whether his particular ones bring both those benefits or whether it brings benefits from doing that before you get into the cold water, I mean, it is, I mean, he's obviously remarkable. And what people seem to be able to do with him is, remarkable but i'm not sure yeah i'm not sure whether that particular combination is you know massively effective or gets you any more benefit than just going into the water having a laugh mm -hmm. and yeah mm -hmm. and, and whether and or not maybe it's doing something breathing it, uh, it separately you know Exactly. And whether or not it's for everyone. I mean, I think he has his techniques and he combines two very beneficial practices, water and breathing, but there's also different ways, maybe not as strict ways or not as cold or not as long ways. So thank you very much for those thoughts. And another question I noted down earlier is if we talk about cold water exposure is it for you rather a prevention or a cure or is it both well wow. yeah that's a good question I, I think it's both and certainly so for so the first study well we've, done, we've kind of done both things really or it, it works simultaneously so i think our most recent study was one where we actually use it as a cure so we had we got uh, 59 people took them on a sea swimming course they all had clinical anxiety or depression and by the end of the eight week course about 70 80 percent of them actually saw a cure from their condition and what was great is that that not quite as good but i mean and most of them had a positive effect but you know Three months later, when we followed them up, most of them were still swimming. And also most of them still were, you know, had gone from clinical, clinically relevant anxiety and depression to no clinically relevant anxiety and depression. So that is definitely working as a cure. But I also think it should be seen as a preventative thing. I mean, you can see it in the context of lifestyle medicine, for example. But also another study we did was we took NHS workers. We... Yeah, so health service workers who had a stressful time during the pandemic. And this, so this was last summer when we were just kind of emerging from it. And what we measured, we took them, we gave them a course. And interesting, some of these courses were in, uh, in Cornwall, where they're you know, in the sea, but others where we found it just as effective were in a, a big swimming pool in the middle of London, unheated outdoor swimming pool in the middle of London. And what we found there is that their uh, measures of burnout and you know in general well-being were were improved by the course and that's very much you know they're obviously stressed but they're not clinically diagnosed and it's having this positive effect so it's definitely a preventive thing as well and i think that's a really important way of looking at it is to see the preventive act, uh, aspect of it mm, no absolutely definitely and again i suppose It's an assumption on my end. It's not only the cold water, but it's the community to go to somebody. It's the structure. It's like being with people surrounded who go for similar things. So wonderful. Thank you very much, Mark. And something I just noted down because you were talking about an unheated pool in London. I don't know if it does make any difference, but does it make any difference to go to an unheated pool, which I guess is a good start, or to go to the sea and Brighton? Is there anything that you maybe personally would prefer and why? Uh, I So I think that most of the effect is just from the cold. So I think really, if you're looking for the health benefits, it doesn't make a difference. I personally love going in the sea. I love the waves. I love the way it's different every day. Yeah, it's, yeah, and the waves, 
So yeah, I say sometimes they're too big. I don't like that because I can't get my swim. I can't get my fix. But the most of the time you can get in and you know seeing different ways every day. Do you get in? Do you not? You know, how do you get in? Where do you go in? You know, this constantly changing pattern is is fantastic. But say that when I'm working in Norway, uh, just before about five, I I got about fifteen kilometer bike ride to to work. And 500 meters before I get to the hospital, there's this little lake, very a small lake. And I stop there and, you know, I'm hot, sweaty, rain going, you know, all that chatter. And, and I go in there and I, I would come out five, ten minutes later, absolutely transformed. It's beautiful, you know, so you get so much out of it. So I think, yeah, I prefer the sea, but, you know, uh, it's the cold and it's being outside. Mm, wonderful. Uh, how much time per year do you spend in Norway and how cold or warm would the water be in that lake that you go for swims frequently? Well, so I'm about half the year in Norway and half the year in the UK. And when I'm in Norway, the, the lake, so the lake basically warms up a lot in the summer. So in the summer, it'd be 22, 23 degrees. Uh, but in the winter, you know, for a lot, of, you know, four months you probably can't swim in it because there's just ice on it you know but but you know there is you know it's uh, we live by the coast and there's places i'll go in the sea and and interestingly last it was christmas eve last year we went for a swim and it's like it's really sheltered harbor really and just as you were walking just at the edge my thermometer measured minus 0.2 degrees centigrade because of the salt water it could get uh get cold and have this little um you know, surface become a bit jellified on the surface. And yeah, that was, that was really cool. I wasn't in that for very long. <laughs> I was about to ask, how was that experience? And not about bragging, but how much time would you spend in such cold water? Uh, virtually two, three minutes. That's all. And yeah, I'm absolutely with gloves, with shoes. You know, I don't want to do it with that. Yeah, I want my, to be able to use my hands to, put my clothes back on afterwards, for example. And I don't want to don't want to deal with the pain. And you know, so gloves, shoes, hat, go in and uh, and basically come out once my breathing I've been under, got my breathing under control, then I come out. When reading your book on cold water, which is called Chill, the Cold Water Swim Cure, there is a lot of success stories with working with people and we have touched on some of them but there is just so many different diseases or conditions so i just want to read out and then we can see if we can discuss one or two of them in a little bit more detail and there is cases from chronic pain from migraines from fibromyalgia from autoimmune disease from trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder and from depression and mental health so there is different success stories from all those different conditions and maybe you want to invite us and we look at one or two of those success stories in a little bit more detail if you want yeah i think oh just just a, a little bit of explanation around that first you know this wide seemingly wide variety of conditions but as i mentioned earlier what we're talking about is reducing the stress response you know to life as it were and Part of that, and the, the most fundamental uh, thing underlying that really is the effect on inflammation, I think. And so again, inflammation, that's our first line of defense. We have a cut, we have invaded by bacteria or whatever. That's what we start. Yeah, you know, that, that's our, our line of defense. But again, we don't want too much because we have too much of it. That's when your body starts attacking the body. And that's the autoimmune conditions. So that's what we're, we're aiming to get that into the good physiological zone again. Now, all these conditions are related in some way to inflammation. And it was really what set me on the path to researching this was just sitting in the pub one evening after work, having a pint, reading the newspaper, not no medical journal, just the Guardian newspaper. And there was an article which said that depression and lots of depression was actually associated with inflammation i think the title is something you know is is depression an allergic reaction 
And I thought, well, you know, I knew by then how good I felt not being depressed when I came out of the water. I also knew about its physiological, the physiological effects of adaptation and how that dampened down the stress and the uh, inflammatory response. And so I thought, oh, that's interesting. Maybe we could use it to, to treat anxiety and depression. And so, you know, we've taken that on and kind of we've discussed you know, the anxiety and depression. I'll give you more specific examples, but that, you know, a big study is the, is kind of the most interesting. So uh, we started off, but a bit of background to that, we started off with just one patient and uh, and she was found through for the BBC for a television programme. And the presenter, uh, you know, when, when we were doing this, I said to the presenter, what if this doesn't work? You know, then my whole theory is blown out of the water. And he said, don't worry, it always works on TV. So what's nice is now we've actually taken it into real life and have shown that it has uh, has an effect. So then you come on to those other conditions. They're all you know, fibromyalgia, uh, migraines, arthritis. These are all conditions associated with inflammation. They're, you, know, you can put uh, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, things like this as well. So any of them. And I think some of them are really interesting. So, for example, uh, Rob, who's a, a very good friend of mine, he had Crohn's disease. So that's an autoimmune disease, disease of inflammation. It's inflammatory bowel disease. And, you know, I'd known him for years, been swimming with him for years. I knew that he used the cold water swimming for his, yeah, for his Crohn's, and it was really effective. But I hadn't got the full background until I interviewed him for the book. I didn't know quite how much he'd suffered in the past and exactly what went on. So, you know, when he was 20, he was so sick and so weak, he couldn't actually walk up the steps at the front of his parents' house, not up a flight of stairs, just, you know, he, he lay on the, uh, on the steps and had to be helped in by his parents. Then last year, uh, he actually completed an Ironman. So, I mean, this is, uh, you know, and what a contrast. And, what he did, so he actually started, he, he thought he wanted to do something for charity. So, and he saw someone on TV swimming the English Channel. And so he thought, oh, I'll go and do that. You know, no thought of his Crohn's at all. I just, he just wanted to do something. And, and this is a common story with a lot of these people. They're really motivated to do something about their condition. But, uh, but they're not sure what. And so they come to swimming kind of by, uh, by accident almost. And anyway, so he started doing that, and he started noticing that his his Crohn's was getting better. And then he stopped swimming for a bit, and it got worse again. And then he started again, and he uh, yeah, then he started again, and it got better. And eventually, just through, I mean, he was at one stage, he was on industrial uh, doses of steroids. Yeah, and the side effects of steroids are horrible. And yet, this seemed to fix it. And yes, and it has fixed it. And you know, he has it occasional relapses but often you know they're very minor it just comes from swimming it gets better wow that's super inspiring thank you very much for sharing that and just for the context how much time would lay between that basically not being able to walk and running or completing rather an iron oh right yeah that, that was 30 30 years but he's been and he's been swimming in the sea for the uh probably known 10 10 12 years um, now yeah, but still, that's a super interesting accomplishment. Thank you very much for that. And good for him in the end. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe. Amazing for him, I think. He must feel so much more alive thanks to having experienced or accidentally found the cold water yeah. exposure. I mean, I mean, he. I think his quote is something like, he, uh, it changes, you know, it's changed every aspect of my life. You know, maybe a completely different person you know, in terms of his body. In fact, there's... That also reminds me, so one of the other guys, uh, is a guy, um, Martin, who suffered from fibromyalgia. He came to one of our courses in Devon for the, because he was, he was very anxious. He didn't come for his fibromyalgia. He suffers anxiety and he came along to that. And he found his fibromyalgia was getting better as well as his mental health, his physical health got better. And his quote is yeah, you know, which I, I just trot out every occasion because it's so good. Is you know he feels alert, alive, with a sense of euphoria and achievement. And taking a tablet, you don't get that.
and, and actually he's been so inspired he's become one of the coaches cold water swimming coaches for the the chill group a uh, way of taking people out into the water no wonderful and you've been talking about the courses and the program now a couple of times and i suppose you're referring to the chill therapy do you want to enlighten us a little bit what you are doing with whom you are doing it and i think the why we already heard yeah uh yeah so this is this came out of a, a chat well someone contacted me uh, about yeah you know, he was an open water swimming coach and coast guard and things like this and he said well it wanted to do something he said look can we do something together can i help you with your research I said, well of course you can you can uh, start running some courses so he's put together these courses under the banner of chill uk or chill therapy and you know there's just these eight week courses of eh, it's not just the swimming it's warming up on the beach meeting people uh, and then afterwards everyone has a cup of tea together yeah or you know part of the thing is you always bring your thermos flask so you have a cup of tea together afterwards and that started with just this clinical trial where we got the 60 pay people through uh through for the clinical trial but now what's happening so we've got a, a basic way of doing it and this is being rolled around around the country so we have i think 20 or 30 hubs now around the country doing the same sort of thing you know coached by him and how to coach but so that you've got the ones which are the clinical ones but you've also you know so the treatment side of it, you've also got the well-being ones so when the courses that i was talking about the nhs workers the healthcare workers they are still running thanks to chill they're going and that is a is the well-being side of things and you know the uh, they've been all been recommissioned yeah you know, we did them last year and then this year 2022 run them again everyone was keen to to recommission no oh, wonderful it sounds like and it sounds like people are motivated they are not only improving their physiology but also their well-being and also thank you very much for sharing some details on the chill program let's call it and you said that this is mostly happening in the uk at least with this particular program and maybe we can use that as a segue for our listeners also if they want to start getting into the cold water or they feel inspired by our conversation how can one prepare maybe physically maybe mentally to go into cold water in the uk but also in different countries I would think there are a few fundamental uh, rules, guidelines, I suppose, of how you can do it. You, know, you can, you could, for example, start with the cold showers. But you know, after all these years, I still absolutely hate a cold shower. I love going into the into the sea, into the lake, whatever. I hate cold showers, so I'm not sure that's always a good thing. But it will sort of kind of get you some resilience for that first time when you get in. I think it's important to find somewhere safe you know it's that getting you know knowing how you're going to get out finding somewhere safe finding somewhere convenient finding somewhere you can get to for six times maybe once a week that's all you need to do make sure you can get there make sure you've got a friend who's going to get there setting a date when you're going to start doing it start when it's warm so start in the middle of summer that's the best thing and remember uh that april may can be pretty much some of the coldest time of the year it's only around june that it really starts starts warming up i mean i know people who've started in winter but i wouldn't recommend it and that's really it it's, it's using a bit of common sense making sure you're doing it with someone make sure you know where you're going and yeah these days there are people everywhere swimming you know so you can always find ah oh, loads of people swim there maybe i can just go there and you know where we swim so we've got our club and you often see people come to the beach and start swim with us at about the same time they've noticed that we've been there and, and very often some of them just become members of the club as well mm, oh wonderful and as you said i think and i believe it's not the first wave of cold water swim or cold exposure but i think this one is a massive one over the past five ten years that people really see the benefits and that we also have evidence based on studies like the ones that you do that it actually does help wonderful thank you very much for that mark and another question i had because i still do know a few people who are somewhat terrified or really not 
up for experiencing those 15 seconds of going into the cold water in the beginning. Is there any good alternative that you can recommend to people other than cold water that has maybe similar health benefits or not? I think the closest, I mean, cold water is just particularly effective and it's very easy as well, actually, you know, because as I say, with a cold bath, you can kind of do it. It's as simple as that or a cold shower. But what you can do is uh, heat therapy. You know, if you look at the effects of heat stress, that is very similar to the effects of cold stress. And there are people who've researched heat stress, and I've learned a lot from them you know, about going in saunas and stuff like this and getting really hot. And... So, you know, and they see similar effects. They see effects on the inflammatory system and they see effects on mental health. So using the heat is, a, is actually a, an alternative. Or you can go and do, do cold another way, you know, these cryo chambers where it's minus 200 degrees or whatever, but it's air because air just, yeah, air is, I think the figure is 2,336 times less cold than water because it's not conductivity, it doesn't hold as much heat and things like this, but we have physical properties. Mm, absolutely. Thank you very much for sharing that, Mark. And I, in fact, have a few questions that I ask each and every of my podcast guests. But Mark, before we go, there are a couple of other questions. And the first one would be, we've talked about the benefits of cold water. We've talked about what each and everybody can do if he or she would like to experience cold water. But is there anything that comes to mind that we didn't discuss in good detail today that you would like to share with the audience? No, I think we've, uh, we've really covered it. The thing for me is just to get across that message is, is that don't stay in too long. It doesn't have to be a long time. Just go in, enjoy it, minimize discomfort, maximize fun. Do it with, yeah, do it with friends. Yeah, that's, keep it simple. Yeah, that's, that's my big message about it. No, I love it. Keep it simple. I think that makes very good sense. It doesn't have to be overcomplicated. And keeping things simple, Mark, where can people find out more about you, the initiatives that you work on, and how can people also engage with you? There are a few ways. I mean, I've got a very basic web website, drmarkharper.com, and you, know, you can find things, you find contact details, you find links to various things I've done there. Uh, in time, if I ever get any time, it'll be. Uh, I'll, I'll aim to bring it up to a, a resource for uh, cold water swimming and research. There's also I also uh, do Twitter occasionally and Instagram occasionally, which is at the World Swim Doctor. So you can see stuff there. Then there's also you can see it's be quite good to if you go, you can go to chilluk.org, which is as we discussed, where, the, they, um, where we start out these things. And we're always looking for new hubs, so certainly around the UK, maybe around, uh, around Europe. You know, we're, we're certainly on for uh, expanding our program. And yeah, I'm hoping to do a bit of research, yeah, a bit more research in Norway, and you know, then we can spread it around. There's lots of interest there as well about this. So that's one thing. You know, and there's, you know, Mike's really happy to sort of do training for other people so more can take this on and bring the benefits. And there's also stuff like uh, Mental Health Swims is another organization I work with. And that's so whereas Chill, you're sort of kind of learning about it. It's, it's formal, it's not formal, but it's more formal it's training in water awareness and stuff like this. Mental Health Swims is just a meetup group. You can go along, they'll say, we'll be here, we'll be there. And they, you know, they provide, they provide a group, really, and they provide someone on the side to answer your questions. You know, they don't really provide a minor safety cover, but it's more of an informal group. You just meet up and, you know, you'll just know other people are going to be there, really. And that was set up by one of the women I write about in my book, Rachel Ash, who uh, has done a, amazing work. And, you know, she has a lot of mental health issues, post-traumatic stress and things like this for which she's found not just benefit, not just from the cold, which is how she came to it, but, you know, this developing this community. 
has, you know, it, you know, she's so, and rightly, she's so proud of it. You know, she's done such an amazing job. Mm. No, it sounds like wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing all those resources. I will definitely make sure to add that to the podcast description, of course. And I'm also going to make sure to link your book because that is also, I believe, a very good start. If this conversation inspired you, get your hands on the book Chill, the Cold Water Swim Cure, because it basically bundles a good package of information and of success stories and of why cold water is definitely a good thing for each and every one. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Mark. And that leads me to my final three questions for today's podcast episode. And the first one would be, what motivated or influenced you over the past week? Motivated or influenced? Do you know, over the past week... What was my main thing is I've just bought this new flat. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the biggest thing is, you know, if there's one thing that's mostly is waking up in the morning, going out and seeing the sea. You know, you've I've really found, yeah, obviously I love the sea. I've spent a lot of time around it. But to just get up in the morning and look at it, my God, it's amazing. It's so powerful. So it's the, the power of water, the power of just looking at water and, and changing water as well. No, absolutely. I fully do agree. I'm also a water person. I always was, so I can definitely feel you there being motivated by living close to the sea. How nice is that? The second question, Mark, would be who are your mentors or whom do you look up to? Well, mentors look up to, yeah. So there's so many people are inspiring. You know, they're, they're everywhere for uh, influence and stuff like this. Yeah, and there are things like I remember I uh, quote Bruce Lee in the book, and you're always finding people in unexpected places who really give you insights into into things. So I try and take uh, motivation from all over. I suppose one that in relation to the cold water swimming, it must have been Mike Tipton, who's the professor at Uh, Portsmouth Extreme Environments Lab, who he'd done a lot of the basic physiology. And when I first met him, he you know, was really enthusiastic and really supportive about getting this research off the ground. And I think that's, that's been great. He also uh, told me to do my PhD. And so I did my PhD with him as my supervisor. So in this particular respect, it's been that, but it's, it's all over. It's my parents giving me the freedom just to... Uh, think how I wanted and given me confidence to do yeah follow my own path rather than a particularly a classic medical career path oh wonderful thank you very much for sharing that Mark and that leads me to the last and final question for today and this is a rather hypothetical one And I call it the three truths or the three facts. And I would like you to imagine that you're traveling in space all by yourself and for actually quite some time. So it could be a couple of months. It could be even a couple of years. And after all that solo travel, you encounter a human-like species. But they can only process three facts or three truths about humanity before they decide whether or not they want to get to know us. What do you tell them? Humans are essentially kind. Most people are kind and nice, I think, is the first one. <laughs> and what would you say? I think there's a, the other one is, but unfortunately, they have, still have caveman physiology and mental processing but space age technology is that one or two facts as you like uh, but they, uh, and do you know what they yeah you know, what i love in life is just going out and having a laugh you know people can have a laugh laughter is so fundamental to good health no absolutely i definitely agree kindness and laughter 
yeah. are so important. Mark, thank you so much for sharing all your expertise and for being a guest on the Just Another Mindset podcast. And if there is any final message, last words for today's episodes, it's all yours. It's just a pleasure being, being on here. I've got my point across it. Do it simply. Don't stay in too long. Don't do it too, don't get too cold. That's that. Just a delight talking to you. If you enjoy this podcast and learn from it, please feel free to share this episode with a friend or two and make sure to subscribe to the Just Another Mindset podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please use the next 10 seconds to give the Just Another Mindset podcast a rating and know that you will help me to create more meaningful content like this and also that it will help other people to find this content and get inspired as well. If there is any future topic or guest that you would like to hear more about on the Just Another Mindset podcast, please let me know by leaving a comment on YouTube or sending a mail directly to contact at ishmaelwondergarten.com. And if nobody told you lately, be reminded that you are worthy, you matter, and you can achieve anything. Just another mindset.